Amid conflicts and a growing climate crisis, the UN calls for urgent action to revive its sustainable development goals. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were back on the agenda this week in New York. The high-level political forum on sustainable development was an opportunity to take stock of the goals, which are intended to alleviate poverty and reduce inequality. In its latest update, the UN says only 17 percent of the targets are on track as the 2030 deadline approaches. We begin with this report from correspondent Jody Jacobs in New York. With a world beset with a myriad of crises, the United Nations' attempts to mitigate these through the Sustainable Development Goals appears to be failing. The barriers are plain to see. Lack of financing, geopolitical tensions and mistrust, ferocious conflicts, the climate emergency and a crippling debt crisis that is leaving many countries unable to invest in development progress. And so we don't have a mo moment to lose. At last year's SDG summit, I called for a rescue plan. Today, I'm calling on member states to move from words to action. In another attempt to achieve the 17 sustainable goals by 2030, the United Nations has convened a conference on sustainable development. Over two weeks, the conference aims to be a platform to review the 2030 agenda at the global level. While we cannot ignore the devastating impacts we face, we must also acknowledge a second equally true reality, one of solutions and progress. Change is happening faster than we think, and extraordinary transformations are underway already. We are indeed lagging, yet we must recognize the significant progress made since the inception of the SDGs. With the world's challenges more intense than ever before, realigning the SDGs has become more urgent. During this conference, several countries reaffirmed their commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth. After being adopted almost nine years ago, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are far off track from being achieved by 2030. And as diplomats gather here in these hallowed walls in New York, the hope is that these meetings are an opportunity to take stock and set a fresh agenda to ensure the goals are reached within the next six years. This conference is the precursor to the Summit of the Future, planned to take place in the fall. It'll bring together global leaders and aims to forge a new international consensus on how to safeguard the world for future generations. Jody Jacobs, CGTN, New York. There is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Mohammed Mahmoud is a water management and climate adaptation expert. Also with us right here in the studio is Changwa Wu. She is chair of the Asia Pacific Water Forum's Governing Council. And Astra Benini is the Senior Sustainable Development Officer with the UN's Division for Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being with us. Astra, great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Uh, let's talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a bit of a struggle right now to fulfill those goals, as we heard in our report there. Um, and there are a variety of reasons on why there is that struggle. There was COVID, there is climate change, and of course there's conflict in many parts of the world as well. And as we noted, only 17% of the targets are on track to meet those 2030 deadlines. Not much time left. Um, what do you believe needs to be done right now? Thank you, and, and thank you for drawing attention to um, the really urgent situation that we face with uh, the Sustainable Development Goals which really reflect the aspirations we all have for a, a more prosperous, peaceful uh, world, uh, better human well-being, and uh, a protected planet. <clears throat> the, the goals, as you said, only 17% of the targets are on track to be achieved by 2030. And we're uh, past, well past the halfway point toward uh, 2030 from 2015. The, the really alarming uh, fact is that one third of the goals have, or the targets have fallen below 
the uh, 2015 baseline or have stagnated. So really not making progress in those areas and even falling behind. There are um, areas like climate action that, that fall into that category. Poverty has increased in recent years during these crises. Hunger is on the rise. And so when we look at those facts, it doesn't feel very hopeful. At the same time, um, we weren't really making significant progress before these myriad crises hit. So we can't necessarily place all of the all of the blame at the current events. Um, the The smartest thing we can do is to look for interventions that can have impacts across a whole set of goals, ways that we can address gender equality, um, that we can ensure access to good jobs, access to sufficient uh, food and water, and address um, climate change, biodiversity loss, many of these at the same time. And the UN has, has identified several areas where this is indeed possible with, with existing technologies, um, scaling up partnerships, and, and bringing different institutions together to address them. Um, these are areas like the energy transition, mm -hmm. like tapping into digital technologies, like addressing the way uh, food production operates so that right. it, it uh, you know, emits fewer greenhouse gases. Um, so there are spaces where there's a lot of potential to very quickly bring about uh, transformative change. Right. And Astro, we were talking about that high-level meeting that's taking place in New York. Uh, the president of the UN Economic and Social Council, uh, Paula Navaez, spoke at that forum. Let's listen to some of what she had to say. The devastating effects of conflict not only destroy infrastructure, but also fracture societies and displace communities, leaving scars that take generations to heal. We have seen it recently in Haiti, Gaza, South Sudan, and many other places. The promise of sustainable development will be incomplete if we do not take decisive action in humanitarian response and invest in prevention. So, Astra, uh, Navaez also said that conflicts around the world are destroying ecosystems and nullifying the concept of sustainable development. Just expand on that for us, please. No, I, I mean, uh, the, the president of ECOSOC has such a, uh, an important message for the approach that we need to take to the SDGs today. And uh, essentially, if we're to achieve sustainable development, we have to have peace. Um, the conflicts and violence that are that are causing huge death, destruction, displacement, um, disrupting uh, systems across the world, we absolutely have to address and and end that level of violence. Um, it's also affecting longer term things like children's health, access to school, um, preventing young people from finding jobs. This, this was part of the SDGs from the beginning. SDG 16 looks at the importance of um, peace, justice, strong institutions right. to ensure that there's a, a foundation that can enable investments in, in key areas for sustainable development. And of course, the destruction on ecosystems mm -hmm. is, is at the heart of, of some of what's happening and, and is absolutely imperative for um, building back in a direction that is sustainable in the long run. Chang Wu, great to have you with us in the studio. You know, as I mentioned, uh, one of the problems we have with trying to fulfill these sustainable development goals was climate change. And if we look at the situation right now, global surface temperatures last month was 1.22 degrees above the 20th century average of 15.5 degrees Celsius. Land temperatures, sea temperatures, they're all above average. So as the UN looks at ways to fulfill these goals, what kind of an impact is climate change having on that? Uh, thank you for having me in the studio. It's, it feels very different actually now, just talking to you directly. So yeah. thank you for uh, the opportunity there. Uh, I think more than ever, the global community recognizes the linkage between climate change and other SDGs. Right. I've been part of the expert panel to review uh, the synergy and even trade-offs, actually, between climate change uh, as well as SDGs there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have deeper knowledge about the synergy, about the interactions, of course, as, as well as the trade-offs there. Uh, so on one side, we have to deal with uh, you know, the hot, you know, heat waves, floods, 
the extreme weather events, and uh, that's why we've been talking about resilience adaptation. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, on the positive side, we started to witness accelerated clean energy transition, um, particularly represented by China moving uh, the industrialization, reindustrialization process to mitigate yeah. uh, you know, our dependence on fossil fuels there. Uh, so with the knowledge, uh, data, uh, as well as the policy incentives put together, we know mm -hmm. there are solutions there. So the, the New York High Level Political Forum for SDGs, I think, yeah. offers a good opportunity for us, for global community mm -hmm. to come together to really zoom in on the linkage, synergy, interactions, as well as our trade-offs, mm -hmm. and so that we know what to do next, actually, what, what lies ahead in terms of pathway. Right, so we're going to need a pretty comprehensive approach if we're going to meet these goals in 2030. Are you confident that they can be met? Uh, I remain optimistically, sort of, in a way, uh, trying to look at the positive side. Right. Uh, as the SDG review, uh, progress review tells us, so that we meet made some 17% of mm -hmm. the goals on the track. If you look at uh, access to water, to right. energy, uh, to food, uh, to broadband, so there are signs of right. hope out there. We already de delivered, but in the meantime, we know there's the other, uh, you know, about 82%, 3% right. there still lagging. And that's where the global community needs to really come together to really understand what is happening, mm -hmm. not only at the global level, but also more and more so at the local level to deep dive into the synergy and the interactions so that we'll be able to find the solutions moving forward. Right. Well, joining us now as well is Michael K. Dorsey. He heads Arizona State University's Walton Sustainability Solutions Service. Michael, great to see you. Now, uh, we've talked about this before, but let's look at it in terms of the sustainable development goals. I mean, healthy ecosystems uh, are essential for the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we consume. But how are human patterns of consumption and production impacting um, our natural resources and, in consequence, our ability to meet those goals? You know, Anand, it's a pleasure to be with you again. You know, the reality is that we live in a world where institutions, particularly uh, fossil fuel institutions, corporations, they socialize a tremendous amount of harm uh, across society, across ecosystems, uh, wanton destruction of ecosystems, and they privatize the windfalls and profits. Uh, the real limiting, constraining factor of the SDGs is that we don't have the financial resources to really scale them, and we're seeing cataclysmic environmental downsides from climate crisis that's unfolding before our very eyes to the loss of biodiversity and on and on and on. We're putting really just billions into achieving the SDGs when we know we need actually several trillion dollars. And, and for your listeners, you know, the difference between billions and trillions may be hard to grasp. But imagine going to a travel agent and you were going on a trip and they said, well, you needed maybe $10,000 and you came with some pennies to the table. That's the difference between the few billions that we're putting towards this problem per annum per year versus what we need to put. We need to put about $4 trillion a year, and we're only coming up with billions to tackle and to achieve the sustainable development goals. That's not enough. We've got to put more resources on the, more resources on the table. We've got to do it faster. We've got to do it with intent uh, to scale and get out ahead of the problem. Mohamed Mahmoud, good to see you as well. Now, goal six uh, among the UN SDGs is to, quote, ensure access to water and sanitation for all. Uh, there is a slight bit of good news, relatively good news. The UN reports that between 2015 and 2022, the proportion of the world's population with access to safe water increased, and it increased from 69% to 73%. But that, of course, still leaves a quarter um, still without access. So talk to us about the role that sustainable water and sanitation plays in development, in eradicating poverty. Thanks, Anand. I mean, it's it's absolutely critical. I mean, the role of water in multiple areas in terms of improving development is is quite uh, prevalent. I mean, you think about water, uh, in a basic sense, drinking water uh, for human consumption needs, but water is also linked uh, in terms of food security and agricultural production. Many parts of the world utilize most of their water supply towards growing food. Uh, water also has a role in terms of energy. Uh, when we think about power plants, water is also required in terms of cooling power plants and uh, in some cases generating power. If you think about uh, countries that have access to surface water systems that uh, have dams and reservoirs that can generate hydropower. So having access, not just access to an adequate supply of water, having a continuous access to that supply of water and one that is clean and safe to drink 
uh, is, is a very basic uh, principle or component that is required for countries to remain uh, uh, competitive in terms of sustainability and development. And attached to that is the mechanisms that can support the usage of that water supply. Do they have robust water infrastructure? It's not just having a water supply. Can we access it, whether it's groundwater, surface water? In some cases, uh, the use of desalination, which requires much investment uh, of financial resources. So it's not just water supply. It's not just managing the demand for where that water is going. It's also having robust systems in place, both in terms of infrastructure and water management. Uh, and so even if water supply is available, uh, if those other components are lacking, uh, it, it does put a dent in terms of the development plans of each of those countries. Astra, uh, let's look at some other figures here. 65 percent of the targets under SDG 2, ending hunger, have been stagnating, 50 percent regressing. 122 million more people uh, facing hunger in 2022 compared to 2019. Um, where are you seeing the biggest gaps? And if we just look on the positive side, I mean, where are the biggest opportunities for progress? Yeah, food, hunger and food insecurity is, is really an essential issue to address right now. And um, there are more that face acute hunger. Um, 309 million people are facing chronic hunger in 72 countries. So uh, we really have to bring together the international community to address those immediate needs. Um, the SDGs are a combination of addressing urgent immediate needs, and there are many with the, the hunger and, and poverty um, crisis and both of those being on the rise. But it's also crucial to look ahead, uh, as, as others are indicating, toward um, the climate crisis, because this threatens in the long run to undermine uh, any progress that we can make toward mm. alleviate, alleviating poverty and hunger. Um, and there are some promising steps in that direction. Uh, the renewable energy revolution is, is taking place, and we can mm -hmm. um, scale up attention to making sure that those technologies are available to those who, who need access to them, that we can close some of those gaps in um, access to finance, access to technology that, that exists, because the SDGs are really a global agenda, so ensuring that um, in, in particular, developing countries have access to the finance they need, yeah. will enable investments in some of these key um, instruments like social protection and um, ensuring food security. So we really need to ensure that the finance is getting to those countries that urgently need it. Chang Wu, uh, Astra mentioned their renewable energy, and that, of course, brings us to China. Uh, last year, the green economy contributed 40% of the country's growth. Big focus, of course, on EVs, electric vehicles, as well as uh, solar and wind energy, alternative sources of energy uh, that are green uh, energy sources. So tell us about this transition in China and where it's heading. The bigger trend is that China is literally rewriting uh, a transformative story, uh, particular put renewable energy, clean energy transition, uh, poverty eradication, uh, ending hunger, uh, as well as build up you know, stronger institutions and partnerships actually with the global community to deliver mm -hmm. uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so if, if from that context there, you started to see progress is made. Uh, that's why actually uh, uh, one major indicator of progress is that uh, you know, green or clean technology uh, industry is starting to play a big role in terms of China's growth. So it's a growth story. It's about mm -hmm. uh, you know, solar, new energy uh, technologies, new mobility technologies, new materials, circular economy, you name it, as well as the infrastructure there. Uh, so from that perspective, China is making a strong case to demonstrate it to the rest of the world that there are solutions, there are technologies. China has built very strong industrial capabilities. And then when you put the policy incentives together to incentivize investment, financial flow into those infrastructure, into clean energy transition, and uh, you know, on one side, of course, we might get the climate change, reduce dramatically reliance on fossil yeah. fuels, but in the meantime, really addressing the social economic factors as well. Well, one example is about uh, you know this sort of revolution happening in rural China, right. meaning you know if you look at the installation of solar wind and uh, battery technologies really all over the country, particularly in rural areas in China. Mm -hmm. Of course, on one side we addressed this poverty issue, we addressed the clean energy access actually in rural areas, but more importantly mm -hmm. is about how people grow their economy, how people live their lives right in a much sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. That's very much aligned with the sustainable development goals and China's experience. China 
China continues to yeah. make the case, but in the meantime, need to work with the global community to accelerate that transition. Right, and as you say, China's been able to demonstrate that there are solutions, and in many respects, if we look at these sustainable development goals, China has been working on that for a long time. We look at ending hunger, alleviating poverty, um, also the transition to green energy. Question is, can any of that be emulated in other parts of the world? Uh, it's a complicated story. I yeah. think on one side, China has demonstrated there are solutions. Yeah. Uh, if somehow we align our you know, agenda around the sustainable development goals yeah. globally to deploy those solutions, which is yeah. sustainable, uh, inclusive, innovative, and resilient there. So there are solutions there. But in the meantime, you, if you look at it deeper, how China has made it so far, meaning there are technologies, you, you do need to build a strong industrial value chains, not only yeah. within China, but globally, to make sure we have enough supply, you know, materials, the industrial products, you know, in, in the sort of mid-range mid sort of right. parts there to really assemble the final products and then deploy, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I think that's complicated. That's why they, where the not only trade-offs, but probably also contradictions right. and conflicts happening now around the trade, yeah. you know, tariffs, whatever. And that's where the global community needs to really come together to yeah. discuss, have a candid conversation, rather than you using, you know, tariffs or trade barriers. We need to work with the, with each other to somehow to make the win-win-win yes. sort of yeah. scenario, so that everyone can benefit from that process. Okay. Uh, my Michael Dorsey, what about the connection between uh, green transition and digital technology? You know, Science Europe said recently, and I'm quoting here, the digital transition supports the green transition with development and technologies that contribute in achieving the target of climate neutrality, unquote. We also have the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He's been talking about this ta challenge. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. We need action on the green and digital transitions. I urge countries to put forward ambitious national climate action plans in 2025 that align with 1.5 degree limit, cover the whole economy, and double as investment plans. And they also encourage a surge in investment in expanding access to digital, digital connectivity and the benefits of the digital economy. And I call on countries to make these transitions just inclusive and fully aligned with broader efforts to achieve gender equality. So, Michael, you know, there we have the Secretary General of the UN talking about making these transitions fully inclusive, aligning them. How do you see it? Well, you know, the Secretary General is spot on. You know, one of the Sustainable Development Goals, number seven, is about securing affordable and clean energy for all. That's actually one of the goals that we're sort of leading the most uh, on most positively for all. Right now, we're on course this year for the first time in human history to invest more than $2 trillion in clean, green energy, mostly wind and solar. Uh, this is going to be game-changing uh, for uh, the planet, for delivering on uh, the seventh uh, sustainable development goal of securing affordable and clean energy for all. One of the things that's going to further accelerate the transition to uh, green energy is actually pairing uh, digital technology with uh, accelerating the deployment of green energy and making it even cheaper and more accessible. So we're on course there, and even more is going to be done and, and needs to be done and will be done. And the fact is, is that that $2 trillion that we're going to see this year invested in uh, solar and wind primarily mm -hmm. is actually more than double the investments in fossil fuels, oil and gas. And that's a good thing because that's going to accelerate the uh, getting out ahead of the unfolding climate crisis. So we're on course here on delivering on the seventh uh, sustainable development goal of securing affordable and clean energy for all. Mohammed, we've talked uh, several times about the uh, financial issue in this discussion. Uh, and you were talking about water and the provision of water and how important that is to achieve these goals. But you know, what about energy? I mean, according to Bloomberg, when you look at the electric grid around the world, uh, expanding that grid is going to take $24.1 trillion, and that has to be done if we are going to meet the net zero goals by 2050. Do you think that can be done by then? It's a tough task ahead, and, and to underline, the, underscore the point that you're taking is we tend to think of expansion of energy in terms of uh, new resources or different types of energy. But uh, I think the point you raise, which is valid, is once we have these new sources available, how do we actually uh, 
deliver those res uh, those energy resources and allow them to be integrated to existing uh, energy grid systems. That requires investment in terms of either overhauls, connectivity. Um, so it's uh, it's a difficult task ahead because you're looking at a few things occurring at the same time. One, acquisition of new energy sources, uh, certainly for places that are more energy deficient than others. And then looking at how do you actually integrate those resources in a way uh, that maybe doesn't require as yeah. much of an overhaul uh, to existing uh, electric systems, electric grid systems. Astro, I've got a couple of minutes left. I want to look at the displacement of people, people who have been forcibly displaced. And according to UN figures, one in every 69 people or 1.5 percent of the world's population is now forcibly displaced. And that's because of climate induced extreme conditions. We look at things like flooding, wildfires, poor air quality, conflict as well. Um, I mean, what can you tell us about the human cost as you know, the world battles to meet these goals? Yeah, they're really immense. And the, the, the thing that we have to keep to remember is that the 2030 agenda committed to leave no one behind. And with all of these conditions, what we see is that the world's poorest people, the most vulnerable, they're the ones that are really bearing the brunt of the consequences of our, our slow progress on all of the goals. And they have the least resources to turn things around so that they have a better future. Um, it's really a huge risk if we miss big across the goals, uh, because already we have estimates that um, on current pathways, we're going to have 590 million people trapped in poverty in 2030. Um, there are some estimates that an additional 360 million people will be living in slums in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And really the way we're going, things like closing the gender gap, it's centuries away. And so to not deliver um, is really going to, to undermine our security, um, the, the, the future for today's youth and, and future generations. And that's really why the, the summit of the future that's coming up this September is a crucial opportunity to think about that and to uh, build greater trust and right. stronger multilateralism so we really can address these global issues. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.